First reading is from Exodus this morning, chapter 20. And God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make, not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day, keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. For the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in the six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Hear these words from Matthew. The chief priests and the whole Sahedron were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death but they didn't find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. Nearly everyone has heard of the Ten Commandments, the list of thou shalt nots found in the Bible. Jesus saw in these commandments not onerous burdens, but guardrails and guideposts designed to help us experience the good and beautiful life. Words that set safe boundaries, create order out of chaos, help communities live peacefully, and protect us, often from ourselves. Every thou shalt not was intended to point to a life-giving, thou shalt. These ancient words were given by a loving God who longed to protect us from harm while pointing toward the keys to a deeply meaningful and joyful life. Words of Life, reading the Ten Commandments through the eyes of Jesus. So here we are, final week of, of Words of Life. Uh, now, obviously, you, if you were following along in Scripture, you'll notice that there is one more command that comes after this, and that is that, that we should not covet anything of our neighbors or anything else. Uh, that we're going to focus on on Wednesday night during Pathways Worship. Uh, but as we get together, as we, as we share this, this message from God, uh, I encourage you to, to have your bulletins. You've got them handy. If you've got pencils or pens, uh, there's a spot in there that you can take notes. There is a spot in there that also has scripture passages and, uh, and questions throughout the week. And so I want to remind you that those are there. One other thing that I wanted to kind of add in this week because of a conversation that I had, uh, had this past week, is that if any time during this message you have a question about something, I encourage you to text it in to me. Uh, I'm not saying that I'll be able to, to answer it right away this morning, but maybe at the end of the service I might be able to address something if, uh, if I'm able to. So if, if something comes up in your head and you go, wait a minute, I, I really want to know about this. Just send me a text. The number is, uh, is in the bulletin. My, my cell number is there. You can text it to that. For those of you at home, it is uh, going into the chat as we speak. <laughs> so uh, that is there for you. So will you pray with me as we begin? Gracious God, I, I thank you for this day. I thank you for bringing us all together as one big family to, to discuss these commandments and, and what they mean for us. 
And so God, I ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to, to truly hear you speak this morning. And God, may the words that I speak no longer be my own, but they would be your words for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. So, well, here's our, our fifth and final week. Uh, the Words of Life is taking this list of laws and, and shifts the focus on seeing them through the eyes of Jesus. Remember that behind every thou shalt not is a greater thou shall. Now, I know that this is not the last week of Lent, but as we finish, we finish, like I said, uh, on Wednesday night. And I hope that you can join us during that service. And we're going to celebrate Palm Sunday and Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday and Easter together on the lectionary passages for those services. I pray that you've already made plans to attend one or more or all of them uh, to help your understanding of this special season. So back to the Ten Commandments. You know, these are not just laws that we are meant to follow because God said so, because many of us have had our parents tell us, this is what you need to do, and why is that? It's because I said so. It's not so much that. We want to follow them because we want to experience that deeper relationship with God. We desire a deeper relationship with God and with others. And so I will remind you one last time, well, unless you're here Wednesday, I'll remind you again on Wednesday, that one through four talk about our vertical relationship, that relationship that we have with God. And then five through ten talk about our relationship with each other, that horizontal relationship that we have, asking us to, in effect, love our neighbors as ourselves. And so I hope that this worship series has meant as much to you as it really has to me. Diving deep into these commands again has brought some things to light in my life. And I hope that during the season of Lent and the focus on these commands, that you have found deeper meaning and maybe even some challenges for your life as well. And so, let's dive into this ninth commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. There is a whole lot of stuff in this. From false testimony in a trial to discerning what is the truth, refraining from gossip, and even the ever-expansive do not lie. So where do we begin? Well, I think it's always good to start with Jesus, right? If you ever wanted a perfect example of this command and what this is supposed to look like, one that really demonstrates a good reason why we should not bear false witness, it doesn't get much better than that passage that Don just read from Matthew this morning. And so as we set the scene, we realize that this has already been a really long day for Jesus and the disciples. They've arrived at Jerusalem. Jesus has cleared the temple, offered a series of teaching moments, celebrated a Passover meal together, walked in the dark to the garden, and then things began to fall apart. Jesus is betrayed by Judas in the garden. He's beaten, arrested, and taken to the home of the high priest. Caiaphas to face the council. Here is where a passage this morning takes place. And so we need to notice that the chief priests were looking for people to give testimony against Jesus. But not just any testimony. They needed false testimony. Because we know that everything that Jesus did was the will of God. What was going to be spoken was going to be a lie. But this is dangerous because giving false testimony or committing perjury in this day was punishable by death, not just by a few days in jail. So it sounds like like they were having a hard time finding two people to speak. And so just so that you're aware, they needed two people to testify, but they couldn't have spoken to each other before. This way, it eliminates that possibility of them working on their stories together. Well, eventually, after many, the priests find two. But we need to pay attention to what is actually said. They testified that Jesus said... I am able to destroy this temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, right? Jesus didn't say this. 
although it has some resemblance of truth to it, in order to get the words that Jesus actually spoke, we would actually need to look at the Gospel of John, the second chapter. And here is what Jesus really said in response to the Jews in the temple one day. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus never said he would destroy the temple. He was telling the people to do it, and then he would raise it after three days. Now, we all know that that Jesus was talking about his death and resurrection, about having the temple of his body destroyed and then raised three days later. But they didn't. The ones who, who testified against Jesus gave some partial truths, but certainly not the whole truth, nothing but the truth. See, they also twisted some of the words that Jesus spoke to incriminate him. Half-truths, omitting some of the facts, twisting some data, and even flat-out lying is nothing new. It was certainly prevalent in Jesus' day and before, which is why we have this as one of those important commands. And we don't have to look very far to see how this presents itself in society today. We can see this in a number of different situations, but let's just look at three. Lying, gossip, and social media problems. There was an elderly man in Phoenix one day who called up his son. He tells his son, I hate to ruin your day, but I've got to tell you that your mother and I are getting divorced. 45 years of misery is enough, and I just can't take it anymore. Dad, what are you talking about, was his son's response. We can't stand the sight of each other any longer. We're sick of each other. I'm sick of talking about this, so you need to call your sister in Chicago and tell her. Well, frantic, the the son calls the sister who explodes on the phone, and she says, well, like heck, they're getting divorced. I'll take care of this. She calls her dad in Phoenix and screams that that you're not getting divorced. Don't do a single thing until I get there. I'm calling my brother back, and we'll both be there tomorrow. Until then, don't you do anything. So the old man hangs up the phone and turns to his wife. says, okay, they're both coming for Easter, and they're paying their own way. Anything else we need? Lying is never good, or is it? <laughs> I mean, we've, we've all told, uh, you know, one or more of those little white lies, you know, the, the ones that we don't really think are going to hurt anybody. We can probably all think of, of a couple that we have said. I mean, the, the standard joke, the standard joke is, is talking about when a husband is asked by his wife about a certain question. However, I think that's a massive overstatement. And a really big generalization. But what are those questions that that husbands ask that wives are tempted to tell a little bit of a fib? I mean, guys, have you ever heard these responses? No, you really can't notice that little bit of gray hair. And actually, it doesn't look like you've lost any at all. Or what about, I would love to hear about your round of golf. Yes, can we please watch more basketball games? No, I have no doubt that you can fix that leaky pipe as she looks up the plumbers on her phone. (laughs) Or maybe this. No, I didn't spend too much while shopping today. Oh, that old thing? I bought that a long time ago. Sometimes lying comes in the form of stretching the truth just a little. There's a reason why many of us refer to them as fishing stories. How big was it? Oh, it was uh, about that big. (laughs) We always hear about the one that got away, right? And of course, I need to let you in on a little known secret from Fisher's past. Let me know if you've ever thought about this. When taking pictures with your recently caught lunker of a fish, no matter how big or how small, You need to hold it in the right position for the photo. You never hold the fish next to you. You always hold it out in front of you. 
This way, the camera perspective gives the impression that the fish is bigger than it might actually be. Sorry if I've burst any bubbles out there. <laughs> Especially for those maybe have, have a picture hanging on their wall of, of one of those. <laughs> I mean, we all know that lying is wrong. But many will ask, actually, if it's ever okay to tell a lie. The easiest answer is, is that it depends on the context. Context is everything. When it comes to interpreting scripture, when it comes to evaluating a big career move, or even when it comes to stretching or eliminating the truth altogether. What is the goal of the lie? If it is to protect others' lives, then it is probably one that you could tell. For those of you who are reading along with us, in Adam Hamilton's book, he talks about a woman who lied to the German military so that she could help thousands of Jews escape. These were good lies to tell. Many times our little lies seem like they will help, but really the only person that we're trying to help is ourselves. And those are the ones that we really need to evaluate. The last lies that I want to mention this morning are the ones that we tell ourselves. When we try to repress feelings and self-image issues with lies, we do damage to the image that God has created within us. Remember, we are created in the image of God. And so when we try to cover up who we truly are, we, in effect, are saying that we don't believe that, that our image and life somehow is created in God's image. Can we stop telling ourselves lies? Can we truly be who God has created us to be? I hope so. Gossip is another way we can bear false witness as we look at this command. When we begin or even perpetuate gossip by spreading half-truths or lies about someone else, we do damage to another one of God's creations. The image of God, right? I've even seen this during, during a worship service. We, we sometimes call this prayer concern gossip. Yeah, okay. I was thinking that, you know, we really don't have that much around here. I have known some other churches, though, that have. We raise these concerns about someone else without their consent, and we really need to ask ourselves a question about why we are actually sharing that. Is it truly because we care or desire health and healing in a number of situations, or are we trying to bring up the dirt on someone? So we need to be careful. Finally, we come, to, we come to social media. Not sure why, but, but it seems like we could actually do a whole worship series on social media. The benefits as well as the dangers. See, there's a new, this, I mean, it's such a new phenomenon, and I, and I think we're only scratching the surface of the distant possibilities when it comes to this form of communication. With this learning curve come, should come all kinds of caution and warning signs. For some, spoken words are easy to say. Confrontation is easy for some of us. However, for the many who don't find that easy, social media offers a platform of anonymity. It becomes easier to share those words that we wouldn't have actually said to someone's face or while they were in the room Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will always hurt me. However, the main part of social media is in as it looks in relation to false witness comes when we can't tell what is true and what is not anymore. Digital media is wonderful until it's weaponized against the truth. We've talked before about the impossibility of living up to what we see on our friend's Facebook feed, especially when they only take pictures of the wonderful moments, of the fish right out in front of you. Wonderful moments in their lives, but this topic takes it a little bit further. Photoshop introduced the idea of changing images digitally to make them perfect. Initially, we could see that that airbrushing people could take away any imperfections. 
But now you can take a picture of someone and you can place them in any place imaginable. I can make it look like I was in Hawaii with Dave. (laughs) Or in Paris. Or I could maybe even be on Air Force One. Without good computer software, you might not never know that those images were fake. So how do we know what is true? How do we know when we are being duped into believing a lie? This becomes a huge problem. And now it's multiplied by how many times people share the information fully believing the lie. Over the past few years, we've, we've all become hyper-aware of this through two words. Fake news. What is real? What is propaganda? And how are we supposed to tell the difference? We've trusted so many people to bring us the truth, but now we are questioning everything. So let me give you just one, one example. Although I know that there are many, many others out there. And please know that this is not a partisan issue. This happens on all sides of political, theological, and social spectrums. Just a little while ago, it's still pretty popular in social media right now, but social media exploded with a story so unbelievable that it had to be true. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter feeds were full of a story that seemed like a page out of history. Whether for social political, religious, or racial issues, books have been banned for a variety of reasons. I mean, just think back. It doesn't take long to go back to the adventures of Tom Sawyer, To Kill a Mockingbird, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Well, social media got wind of some of the images which Dr. Seuss created in a select few of his books. The firestorm was furious. Still is, actually. The problem was this. Many of the posts that I saw, not all of them, but many of the posts that I saw blamed a certain group of people for taking down a few books and a collection of works for children. They saw this as full governmental censorship. But it wasn't. Dr. Seuss Enterprises decided, after reviewing their collective works, to remove a select few of their books. They felt like it was not in good taste with their brand. The partial truth was yes, the books would no longer be produced. But it wasn't the government who decided. Elmer Fudd's gun was another. Don't know if you caught that one. (laughs) The way social media picked up on the story portrayed Warner Brothers as removing all of the previous cartoons which featured this character from my childhood. Elmer Fudd without a gun. True. Old cartoons removed forever? False. It so happens that the actual story is that HBO is picking up a newly produced cartoon series in which they will not give Elmer his gun, just other weapons. Strange as it may seem, the weapon that I had heard was a scythe. I don't know if that's better or worse. But it's only for the new material, not the stuff that I grew up with and many of you grew up with. I know that we've been frustrated with social media sites like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and their censoring of news stories. And while I can't go to Mark Zuckerberg and tell him to stop, I can encourage all of you to be sure that you know what you are posting. As followers of Christ, we need to be sure that we are sharing things that build up, not tear down. Social media can be a good thing if it is used properly. All right. How can we shift our focus of this commandment? How, how can we change the thou shalt to a thou shall? Because we've heard it this morning is, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And so what if we thought about it this way? You shall represent each other well, building each other up with words and actions. We shall tell the truth in everything that we say and do. It's an easy thou shall. Tell the truth. Build each other up. 
that is what God is asking of us today. And so as we, as we wind this, this series down for Sunday mornings, we have another, what would Jesus tell you? And so, and so I wonder what Jesus would speak to us today, and I, and I know that I'm going to ask you again to, to just bow your heads and close your eyes as, as we hear Jesus, what Jesus might say to you coming from Adam's book, because I think these are wonderful words. So listen for Jesus in these words. I know you've been hurt by words others have spoken. I've been hurt too. But with your words, be careful not to harm others. Don't say anything about another that you would not say if they were listening in. Be truthful. And be careful not to judge others. You don't know their hearts. Instead, use your words as instruments of healing blessing and love as you build others up you will find your own heart is filled with joy God we do hear those words we do hear the words of of speaking the truth speaking them in love but but building each other up and not continuing on with, with gossip and with false truths God, sometimes it's hard. It's hard to know what is true and what is not. And so God, in those moments, I ask for your wisdom, that you would truly bless us with that wisdom so that we would know that it is from you and that we would continue to build each other up. Thank you for this message. Thank you for the message in all of your commands. All of this we lift in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.